And um, Sri Byrne is uh, my colleague since graduate school, so he was one year ahead of me at Berkeley, so I know him for quite a while. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He's been here, he was here in 2015 uh, for a different school, but related topic. And um, of course, he started a lot of the things that he's going to talk about. So uh, he got already a prize from Sakurai Medal, and he got the Galileo. this year the GGI. Ga Galileo. Galileo Galilei yeah. Prize, uh, together with Lance Dixon and David Kossauer. David Kossauer will be here in, I think, two weeks for a program we're organizing on a similar topic. So it's a great pleasure to have Svi here. So obviously, feel free to ask questions, and, and hopefully it will be a very lively discussion. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks a lot for that uh, very nice introduction. Um, so I'm going to tell you about uh, the, a, a program for uh, working on the problem of gravitational wave physics starting from uh, scattering amplitudes, quantum scattering amplitudes. And this is work that I've done with uh, some absolutely wonderful collaborators that are listed there. So we all know the era of gravitational wave astronomy that it's begun. Uh, and um, I remember the day it was announced, and I heard that the uh, emission of the, the power emitted in gravitational waves in the event that was found, it was greater than the power emission from all the stars in the visible universe. So that seemed pretty amazing, and it really seemed like something that I would like to work on. Uh, but the problem is, of course, how do you work on something and actually help? I mean, there's many things you can work on, uh, but how do you actually help with, a, you could say, the core emission of gravitational wave detectors? And that's what I want to explain. So a first question is, uh, what does particle physics have to do with general relativity, classical physics? Uh, is there a laser? Are there? Oh, there it is, yeah. Uh, <coughs> what does that have to do with uh, general relativity? So when we do quantum field theory, we're thinking about a very different kind of problem. It's, let's say, collider physics. So protons come in. There's an event here. This is actually a Higgs event. Uh, and uh, you, you model it using quantum field theory. First thing is we're talking about unbounded trajectories. We're talking about gauge theories, quantum chromodynamics, there's electroweak theory, quantum field theory. And that looks to be a completely different problem from the emission of gravitational waves from, let's say, two binary black holes. Uh, here, you use general relativity, classical physics. Um, but in fact, they are related. And this was known for a long time. Uh, it, it's basically due to the fact that as long as we're interested in long wavelength radiation, as long as the black holes are well separated, we can think of the black holes as point particles. And, uh, and this is completely standard, no matter how you actually solve this problem. Uh, the, the, this is the way you would solve it in a perturbation theory. Um, and it, to do it in the context of effective field theory, basically quantum field theory, uh, <coughs> you just make use of the fact that these black holes are points compared to the other scales. If they're points, it's in our wheelhouse. We know what to do. It's point particles. Right? And that's the basic idea. And uh, this was understood long ago, even earlier than that. And this was systematized in uh, a great paper by Goldberger and Rothstein and many others. OK, there's Ricardo Sturani, who's the expert, wherever he is. There he is, right? So if you have questions, you should ask him. <laughs> um, and uh, we're going we're gonna to be looking at quantum field theory in a specific context, scattering amplitudes. Uh, and over the years, there's been great progress in doing quantum scattering amplitudes not only in collider physics, but also in general relativity using gravitons. Whoops. Whoops, wrong way. I'll get there. OK, so how are we going to attack that problem? Well, first, this is the normal way. There is Einstein. Everybody likes Einstein. Everybody loves his field equation. You think about geometry. 
um, and you basically go ahead and you try to solve Einstein's equation. Uh, that is not the way we do it. We don't do geometry. Okay, I like Einstein, but not for this problem. Uh, we're going to be working, starting from Feynman, the idea that gravitons are spin-2 particles and that general relativity follows just from this fact. Massless spin-2 particles, and then you should be able to derive and obtain general relativity. The extra ingredient we're going to have is that not only is, is it something you can derive and show that gravity follows from this idea, but it's also useful in the context of certain problems. It's in the context of perturbation theory, and that's kind of obvious. Once I use the word graviton, it means I'm in the context of perturbation theory around flat space. Uh, as, and th this way of thinking is very well suited for problems where you have an asymptotic flat, a asymptotically flat space time. Okay, and one of the problems it actually is well suited for is in fact this problem of gravitational wave emission from uh, a pair of black holes. Okay, now uh, we've gotten very good at uh, perturbation theory in gauge theory and supergravity theories. Uh, so it seems like maybe we could do something. In fact, that you could say that was our initial motivation. Uh, but there are two serious issues, and I have to explain how we deal with that. One is we do quantum perturbation theory, not classical perturbation theory. So you have to understand how to go to the, go to the classical limit. Right? Uh, if you have a quantum theory, then you have to take h bar goes to zero, and then classical physics should arise. Uh, and the other point is, uh, when you're doing scattering amplitudes, and since you're not looking at the most important problem, which is two black holes in orbit, you're looking at a different problem, two black holes coming from infinity, and they scatter off each other. Okay, um, so it's the wrong problem. So the question is, how do we deal with that? Um, so there'll be a couple, uh, two key topics. One is, first I'll explain how we do perturbative gravity, modern way. And the other will be, how do we deal with these annoying issues? Okay. So first, what exactly is the problem? And the thing we're interested in is, you could say, the actual problem the real deal of black holes, let's say they're in orbit around each other, and they're emitting gravitational waves, the orbit decays, there's a merger, and then after the merger, there's a ring down. The part of the problem that the tools of perturbation theory are good for, it's out here. You have to be well before the merger, because remember I said the black holes are points. If you get too close to where the merger happens, that's no longer true and the whole approximation breaks down. So here, the appropriate tool is perturbation theory, like we're going to do. Over here, you want to use numerical relativity. And then out here, the ring down, the final black hole is just vibrating and emitting gravitational waves. You want to use a different perturbation theory. And, and this is, this is uh, exactly how it's done. And it's this part here that we'd like to use, apply the techniques to. Now, maybe one comment that's kind of important, the numerical relativity, you could say, is the exact solution done numerically, okay, within some numerical error, but it's the exact solution uh, to general relativity, so why don't you do it everywhere? And the answer is because it's expensive. Uh, you would not be able to get enough money from the funding agencies to possibly uh, generate all the information that you need, all the templates, they're called templates. Okay. Uh, and uh, something very important, that we have to go to very high orders of perturbation theory. We need high accuracy everywhere, because uh, if you're watching a waveform for many cycles, uh, and in the future the number of cycles will greatly increase, if you have small errors in the, f in the phase of that wave, they accumulate, so then you have the wrong waveform. If you want the correct waveform, then uh, you need high precision. And that motivates why people go try to 
get to a high as order of, of perturbation theory as you possibly can. Okay. And, um, oops, oh, wrong button, sorry, got to get used to this. Okay, so d just a couple comments. Uh, of, um, first, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about the uh, post-Newtonian approximation. Uh, so the idea is to correct what Newton told us um, by use of general relativity. So this is a two-body potential. There's a two-body Hamiltonian here. And you'll recognize this exactly as Newton. And the idea is to use general relativity to figure out systematic corrections. Uh, here I'm showing you this is called first post-Newtonian order, Einstein and told Hoffman. Uh, and that's the next correction. Now the, the potential, it depends on the momentum, right? So it, it's more complicated. Uh, and then uh, 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 systematically, well, oh, maybe, maybe one more important thing is the um, post-Newtonian approximation. You do a double expansion in velocity and in Newton's constant. And the reason you do that is if you have a nearly circular orbit, these things are the same. So you really should do a double expansion. Okay? Or, or it's, it's uh, easier to do it that way. Now, um, over the years, people have been systematically marching down the orders. There's uh, uh, the 2pn, second post Newtonian, third, fourth, and just marching on. People are uh, well along on 5pn. Uh, Ricardo can tell you about that. Uh, now, the reason why people do these calculations is not because they are entertained by it, although I think many people who do this really like doing those calculations. So they are entertained, but the real reason is because it's necessary. Uh, this, this, has, this, is a, this is an older plot, but it shows you, uh, it gives you a measure of these different PN orders. The half PN, that has to do with emission. This is the, the quadrupole emission right here. Um, and it, it's a measure, the lower down you are in this plot, it's a measure of sensitivity uh, that LIGO is, LIGO is sensitive, this sensitivity of LIGO Virgo to uh, th these PN orders. And the answer is it can see it. Well, if the experiments can see it, then indeed you should calculate it. It's very simple. Now the future. Uh, maybe a question of how high an order of perturbation theory can you go, do you need to go to? And the answer to that can be found on this plot. This is today. This, this is a plot of, basically a plot of sensitivity. Oh, I keep on covering up the laser. That's the problem. Uh, it's a plot of sensitivity. So this is today, this is uh, advanced LIGO. And, and uh, this is, you could say, where we are in sensitivity. And the sensitivity, it increases greatly in, th in the future. So 10, 20 years from now, sensitivity is going up by a factor of 100. So a factor of 100, it basically translates uh, as far as uh, for practical matters. How high should you go? As high as you can. You need at least two more orders of perturbation theory in the post-Newtonian approximation for the to match this future, the future. Okay, and that doesn't, I, I, this is ground-based detectors. There's, there's important reasons why you, uh, you really need m greatly improved methods for what's called extreme mass ratio binaries. That would be space-based. So there's a challenge in the community to match what's coming from the, fi from the experiment. Okay. And these calculations are very hard. So the fact that the uh, experiments, the, uh, the future experiments might be 20 years away is not a reason to sit around and wait and say, okay, I'll do the calculation 20 years from now. That probably is not a good idea because uh, you really have to work very hard to develop new techniques. Okay. Now, when we started looking at this problem, we had a laundry list. What should we work on? Okay, and there's all sorts of things you can work on uh, that would be uh, perfectly reasonable for us to look at. Spin, finite size effects. So that would be more appropriate to, let's say, thinking about neutron stars. 
uh, the, the uh, new physics effects. After all, we're particle physicists, so that'd be the natural place to work. You can think about radiation, uh, so that's the energy that's flowing, uh, the gravitational wave energy that's flowing out from the system. You could work on that problem. Higher orders of perturbation theory would be another one. And which was the correct problem to solve? So uh, we thought about it, and we had three criteria. It needs to be difficult using standard methods. If it wasn't difficult, why, does the why do they need us? Right? So we have to work on a problem that's hard to solve using uh, traditional methods. It had to be something new and different. Uh, it needed to be of direct importance, at least to the theorists. Uh, uh, and, and then uh, the final th criteria we had is that whatever we would do, it had to be in a format that it could enter the LIGO-Virgo analysis pipeline. Okay. Now the answer of what to do, the best one on this list, was what we call two-body Hamiltonian at third post Minkowskian order. And this became clear because, well, there's a paper from Thibaut Damour, it's actually kind of amusing. Uh, let me expand that out so you can see what it says. Uh, it says, and we urge amplitude experts to use their novel techniques to compute two-loop scattering, amp uh, two scattering amplitude of scalar masses from which one could deduce the third post minkowskian effective one-body Hamiltonian. I'll, I'll explain in a minute what this post minkowskian approximation is. Uh, now, there was an invitation that was very clear. It automatically satisfied all criteria. It is important to the theor theorists who work on this. I mean, there we have a theorist. Uh, it had to be hard, and it was, it was hard. Certainly at the time it was hard, now it's not so hard. But at the time it was very hard because uh, no one asks you for help unless they actually need some help. Uh, and then uh, the idea, you see the word Hamiltonian here, two body, uh, well it's called effective one body Hamiltonian, but it's basically the two body interactions. Uh, so th this looked like something that, uh, would be, in principle, something that could enter the analysis pipeline. Okay. And in case we were asleep at the wheel, there was uh, Alessandro Bonanno who came to Amplitude 2018. That was uh, over at Stanford, uh, and she explained very nicely exactly what uh, was needed. It's this. Uh, it's a little busy, but anyway, it's, this is the. This is the. The. This is the uh, uh, slide from her talk. Uh, and it, uh, she organized, it's organized this way, that there's post-Newtonian correction, 0 pn, that's Newton. You see there's mv square. Then there's a 1 over r. 1 over r actually means g over r, gm over r. So this is Newton. This is Einstein, Infeld, Hoffman. And then marching up, uh, all the green has been done. And then. Uh, you see, at the fifth post Newtonian order, there are missing pieces. So she said, uh, go calculate this, especially this third post Minkowskian one. So what that is, it's like post Newtonian, but you keep all orders of velocity. Now, we who do particle theory, we don't call it post Minkowskian, we call it perturbation theory. It's an expansion in the coupling constant, in Newton's constant. So. I know it's got this funny name, but it's just perturbation theory. Standard perturbation theory is what they're talking about, uh, what we would call standard perturbation theory. And here's a very nice plot. This is uh, from uh, this paper, Budano and others, where uh, t they explain about the different regions as eccentricity. So if, when you get to highly eccentric orbits, then the post minkowskian that's the one where you're keeping all orders in velocity, becomes much more important. That's probably not a surprise, because as the thing whips around, gets close to the black hole, it's moving pretty fast. So you want to have a better approximation. Uh, and then you can see different area, like for different eccentricities, uh, and different you know, setups, you can see which, in, you know, this post Newtonian, post Minkowski, numerical relativity. If you want to understand all of it, then you need, uh, of course, all these methods to cover different regions. Yeah. And then, oh, then maybe uh, something important 
is all of those, that information would get, the idea is to package all of this into a model that covers everything using all the information that you gather from the different approaches. Effective one body is a very popular way of doing that. Okay, so, uh, so let's talk about uh, quantum field theory and scattering amplitudes. So our normal hunting grounds for scattering amplitudes would be collider physics uh, and thinking about, let's say, this is, this, this is a, a process that involved the Higgs boson, and the way you do it is by working out, let's say you could try Feynman diagrams. I'll talk about more advanced things. Uh, so I you can do Feynman diagrams, and you organize perturbation theory between trees and loops. Trees are the lowest order. The, these loop diagrams, these pictures, these Feynman diagrams are uh, higher orders of perturbation theory. Now, of course, right here, this has, looks like it really has nothing to do with gravitational waves. Well, okay, the first thing is just a, an example of how improvements have happened over the years. So, of course, uh, if you've taken a course on quantum field theory, uh, you know about Feynman diagrams and you're taught how to deal with, uh, let's say, here's a five gluon amplitude. In principle, you can go off and calculate that. Certainly with a computer, you can go ahead and do it. Uh, and uh, if you follow the Feynman rules, uh, this is what happens. Uh, this is actually a tiny piece of it. It's, I think it's 1 25th of it. And it just keeps on going. And the reason why it's so complicated is because there's all these polarization vectors. And they carry extra degrees of freedom, unphysical degrees of freedom. So you have to build a very complicated expression that eliminates those degrees of freedom. Okay, and there's much better ways of doing it. Uh, so Yaroslav Trinka has been giving lectures on spinner helicity. Anyway, he wrote down formulas just like this. So it's, you can really write down much simpler expressions. You know you're going in the right direction when you get things this simple, when the equivalent formula done the textbook way, or older textbooks, new textbooks are closer to this. Uh, older textbooks would be what I showed you before. Okay. So using helicity states, obviously a good idea. So that's one example of how we improve things. Now, there's, um, if you look at loop level, you can actually track down who, who's causing a lot of grief. And that has to do with the fact that uh, we use off-shell states. And that, at, in this perturbation theory, you're supposed to do an integral over all momenta, all energies. That means these particles are not physical. Okay, we give it a fancy name, virtual, but you know, virtual a better name would be imaginary. They're not. They're not. These are not real particles. The, 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 these objects. They're not gauge invariant. Individually, a Feynman diagram is not a physical thing because it's a gauge dependent quantity. It depends exactly how you do it. The key for reorganizing things is to think about gauge invariant quantities, amplitudes, a systematic way of, avoid, of doing things so that doing things so that Einstein's relation between energy and mass is not violated, and to systematically build up all the scattering amplitudes through the perturbation theory without violating Einstein's relation between mass and energy and momentum. And to keep things gauge invariant, and there's a formalism which, yeah, obviously, obviously not going to explain it, how you can systematically build up order by order perturbation theory. You can build up uh, all scattering at any order of perturbation theory using only on shell data, and that means you're working in a gauge invariant way, and you find uh, much simpler expressions. Okay, and you also want to use spinner helicity and so on. Um, and and th these ideas, we call it generalized unitarity, these ideas, uh, th they feed directly into gravitational wave problem. In fact, this diagram, these diagrams are taken from our paper on gravitational waves, how you're supposed to do the calculations using this on-shell way of thinking about perturbation theory. Now. Um, let's have a look at the comparison between gravity and gauge theory. 
uh, just thinking about it, let's say the normal textbook way, where you're thinking about um, Feynman diagrams, Lagrangians. So there's the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, and the way you're supposed to do the perturbation theory is you take the metric that's buried in there, and you expand around some background. It doesn't have to be flat space, but some background, and then there's fluctuations, the graviton field. And you feed it in there, and then you go ahead and calculate. And what you discover very quickly is that it gets out of hand. Uh, it, that you don't see any pattern. There's no logic to it. It's just a mess. And it depends exactly what gauges you use. Things look very different. But, but generally, you'll find, uh, uh, yeah, at least uh, unless you're more clever and reorganize things, you, you're going to find yourself with some infinite complications. Okay, and if you compare that to uh, the uh, gauge theory Lagrangian, the standard gauge theory Lagrangian, Yang-Mills, it's much simpler in Yang-Mills, the three vertex, four vertex, and it doesn't look like there's any simple relation between the two theories, that they're, it looks as if though they're completely different, except in some superficial way. And let's have a closer look at that. When you look at the three vertex, and there's the three vertex of Yang Mills, it doesn't look so bad. Uh, it's a little, maybe a little complicated, but not so bad. When you look at gravity, it's really out of control unless you figure out a much more clever way of doing it. So uh, this, this thing, okay, it looks bad, but it, it's worse because this P6 hides something. It says I have six terms. There's six permutations three permutations, six permutations, and so on. All the different relabelings. There's a sim here. I'm supposed to symmetrize. There's a symmetric tensor here, so I have to symmetrize. And this thing has about 100 terms, and I don't know. It does not look happy. This is probably uh, not the right way to do things. The better way of thinking about this problem is to... Uh, Think about it on shell. So we want to use on these legs the fact we want to think of these as physical particles. So the on shell Einstein's relation is satisfied. Okay? And uh, if you do that to the Yang Mills case, not much happens. It's more or less the same. You can clean it up a little bit, but it's more or less the same. But the Einstein gravity vertex collapses. And what you find is something really remarkable that this Einstein vertex. It looks like a product of Yang Mills kinematic vertices, right? It's like two copies. We call it, we're going to call it double copy, the square of the Yang Mills vertex. Okay, and 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 this might look like an accident. You know, it's like gravitons are like two gluons. That's what it says. But it's no accident. In fact, back in 1985, Kawhi Luan and Tai they were studying string theory open strings, closed strings. The open string, uh, the low energy limit or the massless states are gluons. The closed string, the massless states are gravitons. So you can translate that in the low energy limit and the field theory limit as a relationship between gravity and gauge theory. And it's something really remarkable, really profound. It says that all the dynamics of gravity at least at tree level, so for a given number of particles, like five gravitons interacting, for a given number of particles, all the dynamics is encoded by the, by the um, Yang-Mills, by gauge theory. So in a sense, there's nothing new in gravity. If you can do Yang-Mills, you can do Einstein. That's what this says, and in fact, you can do this at any number of legs. For This is now tree level, so no loops. Okay. Um, so it says gravity is derivable from gra gauge theory. I mean, the formulas are, th are gravity on one side. OK, it's uh, flat space perturbation theory, so it's not, uh, it's not um, in a form that's useful for doing, let's say, non-perturbative gravity. It's perturbative order by order and perturbation theory, but it says everything in gravity is, uh, 
encoded in gauge theory. Okay, and we're going to be able to go to loops, loop level, by using what I said before, this generalized unitarity. So in fact, the statement will be all of gravity, perturbatively. It's encoded in gauge theory. You don't need Einstein's Lagrangian anymore. That's why I crossed out Einstein's field equations. We don't use that. We use some version of this, not this particular version, but we use some version of this. Uh, and the thing I, I actually find remarkable, okay, now we've, been, we've known this for a very long time. Go find this in the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, what, what I just showed you. Well, there's no derivation I know of other than cranking it out order by order and verifying this. But there's no simple way or no known way that you could start with Einstein-Hilbert and say it's equivalent to Yang-Mills through this, this construction. Nevertheless, it's true. There are many proofs of that. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, it's very general, the very general property of gravity. The details of what gravity theory we're talking about uh, are not so important. This is very generally true. Now, here's another way of looking at it, a, a reorganized form of the same thing I just showed you. We call it um, color kinematics duality. And uh, it, it's perhaps something even more surprising. So the idea is we start with Yang-Mills. Um, and we um, organize it in a certain way so we can work out. In fact, today, today uh, I was telling the students homework. We're going to discuss that homework later. So I actually do what's on the slide, which is work this out. Work out the four-point scattering of gluons. Uh, and then organize it in a way so that this four-point contact term is a four-point interaction. So it's missing a, there's a missing propagator, a missing like one over S. So basically, you've got to put it back in there. Uh, you absorb pieces from here into these three different diagrams, and then you write it as a sum of three different diagrams, S channel, T channel, U channel. And so there's like different labels on here. Okay. Uh, that, I mean, in a sense, the same diagram, but each one, S, T, and U, are just relabelings of the external legs. Okay, and um, once you put it in this form, but you have to keep these gluons to be on shell. It has to satisfy Einstein's relation. It has to be transverse. It has to have phys you know, physical gluons. You'll discover something pretty amazing, that the Jacobi identity, which is a relationship between these prefactors, these are uh, matrices that tell us which gluon couples to which. So these are the color factors. And the underlying the color factors is the Lie algebra. Lie algebra satisfy a Jacobi identity. So these things satisfy the Jacobi identity. There's the Jacobi identity. Color factors of this one, the color factor of that one, the color factor of that one, add it up, you're going to get zero. That's a Jacobi identity. With, with appropriate size. So let's say here I have a, uh, there's a color factor Jacobi identity uh, that relates the colors. Well, the homework will be to go calculate, let's say using Feynman diagrams, whatever way you want, uh, fancier techniques, calculate these numerators, and you'll find it satisfies the same Jacobi identity. Now, uh, this, this has been... Uh, uh, proven at general for any number of legs. Uh, the, cla this, the claim or the thing that's been proven is that you can always put the amplitude in a form so that for every color identity, there is a numerator identity, a one-to-one -one match. So you say, oh, that's very amusing. What are you going to do with that? And the answer is gravity. We're going to do gravity. The secret of perturbative quantum gravity is on the slide if you know how to read it. This is how to read it. So we take a tree amplitude. So, so far, we're just talking tree level. And uh, what you do is you organize it in such a way that uh, it's in terms of diagrams. Yang, these are now gauge theory. It could be QCD. Uh, it could actually literally be QCD you could do this for. 
uh, organized in such a way that uh, the, for every color identity, there's a color identity, these kinematic numerators satisfy exactly the same relation, the same Jacobi identity. And uh, the claim, which is actually very easy to prove, once you know that this is true, then you, this, pr this is actually easy to prove. Um, the, the, you, can, you can then show that what comes out is gravity, that gravity is just given by the substitution. You take, you take uh, the um, color factor replaced by a numerator factor, and that gives you a gravity amplitude. It looks like magic. In fact, it is magic, and what the definition of magic is is that we don't understand why this is true. So you think there's an underlying Lie algebra behind the kinematics, an infinite dimensional Lie algebra, and there's some understanding of that, but an incomplete understanding. Nevertheless, we can prove it's true. Right? So once you know it's true, you can start using it, and the way you use it is by converting gra gauge theory into gravity. So that's how we do gravity. We do gravity by doing Yang-Mills, and then we convert it. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, this definitely cries out for a unified description of gravity with gauge theory, it, presumably something along the lines of string theory. Of course, it doesn't prove string theory in any way. But you notice that the detailed dynamics of the theory, it's controlled by these numerator factors. They're identical in the two theories. Pretty remarkable. And in fact, you could build uh, some very big story around this, uh, which I'll just briefly flash. Uh, so th th this is like a web of theories connected by double copy. That if you see a theory, it's built out of th two other theories. Like let's say this was, this, these are supergravities, so underlying that are Yang-Mills theories. And there's a line connecting, and if one of the theories is shared by some other theory, and there's a, a whole like web of theories that are related to each other in this way. So it gives us a new way of thinking about how to classify theories, different types of theories. Okay. So the summary of this, before I, I get to the gravitational waves, is uh, in a very precise sense, we now understand, uh, in, in perturbation theory, we understand very well, how gravity is a copy of uh, two gauge theories. So we can convert the gauge theories into gravity. At tree level, I explained my basic idea of how to do it. Color factor goes to numerator factor. And then if you want to go to loops, we have the generalized unitarity. It takes tree amplitudes, converts them to loop amplitudes. So the entire theory, could, uh, all orders of perturbation theory can be done this way. OK, and there's two examples of where this has been applied. There's many other examples, but these are the two best examples. Would be uh, five loop supergravity. We were interested in non renormalizability prop properties of these theories. There's a lot of statements about how it works, and the idea is to just directly calculate that. And you go all the way to five loops and learn what's, learn what's going on up there. Uh, the number five. That's actually controlled by gauge theory. Say, what's the highest order that's been done in, let's say, QCD? The answer is five loop beta function. And it's, that's where the number five comes from. If we, someone can do a calculation in gauge theory, we can do the calculation in gravity. That's the basic idea. OK, and the other one, which I'll talk about here, is, extract, is higher order corrections to Newton's potential, all the way to g to the fourth. and we're actually working on the next order now. OK, so what are we after? So maybe here's a, a, a way of stating the problem. Uh, what you want to do is replace general relativity with a two-body potential. Um, and, um, and, and you would want to, you know, if possible, at higher orders it becomes more complicated, and there's uh, some grief, but what you'd like to do is put it right, figure out a two body potential that you can also use in the bound state problem. And in a way, you could say you're trying to extract the physics juice 
by using these effective two-body Hamiltonians uh, to, extract the, uh, the, uh, to extract physics information, but leave behind the complexity of general relativity. Okay. So it's, you could say, well, what are we after? Something like Newton's potential, except uh, it needs to be compatible with special relativity, that means all orders in velocity, and it needs to be valid to a given order of perturbation theory, let's say g to the fourth. How, how does this work? Well, there's a very nice paper, Chang, Rothstein, and Salon, uh, basically explain how to link, uh, the, oh, that got chopped off there, uh, gravitational scattering amplitudes, so that's amplitudes community, and then effective field theory methods, which allow us to extract the potential. In a sense, you join two communities together, and by using ideas from both, you extract the potentials that you're interested in. Now, uh, it looks a little bit roundabout because we're starting with quantum scattering amplitudes over here, and then you have to take h bar goes to zero. But this is actually not such a big problem because uh, you can do this very early. You can, you can basically throw away quantum pieces. Okay, and the idea is that you leverage Ad great advances in scattering amplitudes, the whole machinery that, that's been used for doing high loop computations in gauge theory and also in uh, supergravity, you leverage that in or order to do this problem. Maybe one little amusing thing. Okay, so uh, the students have worked this out. If you want the tree level potential, uh, you take this Feynman diagram for a transform and you're done. That's a little homework exercise, and it's very simple. So that, this formula, this relationship that the potential we're interested in is the, f the scattering amplitude, except you have the Fourier transform, uh, basically explains the connection. You know, how is it that we can do these things? It's because we're actually calculating the right thing in disguise. I mean, you wouldn't naturally think this scattering amplitude is a potential, but there's a very simple relationship just through a Fourier tra transform. Now, if you start going to higher orders of perturbation theory, oh, I see, yeah, there's a little problem. Yeah, sorry about that. I converted from PowerPoint to Keynote, and this is the, I missed that. <laughs> uh, things didn't quite convert. But anyway, when I, when I was in graduate school, I learned every loop is an H bar, so this is all quantum. Uh, that's actually completely wrong. Uh, the way it actually works is that these loops have classical pieces inside of them. Uh, and in fact, the scaling, at least I was taught in graduate school, but I'm sure you guys were taught the right thing, is the correct scaling is that instead of scaling, loops go like h bar, they actually go like 1 over h bar. If you do the scaling to answer the question of how do you extract classical physics, which is not the way they were scaling it. Right, we learned that every loop is an H bar. That is completely misleading. Uh, the the answer is actually quite different. Uh, now, all of this, th there's all this chaos of trying to understand what's going on. Uh, effective field theory is a very good way of doing it. Let me just show you a little thing about effective field theory. This is the effective field theory we use. It's actually very cute. Uh, it's an effective field theory for black holes. So this field is a black hole, one black hole, two black holes. It doesn't matter that these things are gigantic. The effective field theory will work as long as there's a separation of scales. Black holes have to be far apart. The radiation has to be long wavelength. And then we're good to go. And this effective field theory defines the potential. So you see, here's the kinetic term. It's relativistic. You may notice it's first order, not second. Why? Because we don't have antiparticles. We're doing classical physics, so no, no antiparticles. Uh, and then this defines our potential. It's an interaction of two black holes through a potential, right? Um, and the thing we're trying to actually calculate is this potential, find out what the potential is. How do you do that? Well, a natural way is, uh, oops, is, a natural way is through a matching calculation. So this is completely standard in effective field theories. You do one calculation, there's full general relativity, it's complicated, 
you take out heavy artillery, amplitude methods, double copy, generalized unitarity, or you take h bar goes to zero appropriately. Then you got to deal with some integrals. The integrals are actually a big problem. Uh, they take, they, there's, you know, there's some technology that comes from uh, collider physics how to do that. And then you get an amplitude. Simultaneously, you do a much simpler calculation where you build an ansatz for the potential. You write down every single possible term that you can have in the potential. And then you calculate, treat it through some Feynman diagrams. And you do the integrals. They're actually simpler integrals. And you get a, an answer. Uh, we call it the effective field theory loop amplitude. How do you figure out the potential? You just demand that these be identical, and that allows you to determine the parameters of the ansatz that would give you the, the match the physics. If the physics, if the amplitudes are identical, then you have an effective field theory description in terms of a potential. You got a potential, you got a Hamiltonian. You got a Hamiltonian, you can do classical physics. That, that's the basic idea. Now, uh, the way it works in the calculations is uh, we use this generalized unitarity method. And very early, we noticed something uh, that put us in what we call unitarity heaven, where all the ideas of, of thinking about on-shell, like these gravitons have to be on-shell, is on-shell matter here, uh, that, that, that fits perfectly with the, this problem. And the way that happens is you're interested only in long-range forces, and that forces you to have gravitons here, but you have to have a propagator. And that's, that's basically saying there's a residue on, a, on a, what's called a unitarity cut. So these gravitons, at least for the construction of the thing you're supposed to integrate, they're on shell. And then you get another leg that Einstein's relation is satisfied because in doing the integral, the energy integral, you're supposed to be doing classical physics, so you better get back to Einstein, Einstein's relation. So you have to pick up a residue on a pole, which puts the thing to satisfy Einstein's relation between energy and momentum and mass. Uh, so everything's on shell, and it fits perfectly with the way we do things. It's really awesome. So anyway, as I said, we were in unitarity heaven when we realized this. Because it could, it could be that you have a formalism that doesn't match very well with a problem. But here it matched immediately. It was exactly what we were do anyway doing. OK? Uh, let me just show you how you might uh, go about doing this. Uh, so this would be the Kawhi Llewellyn and Tai way. Is let's say I want to calculate two-body interaction. There's one black hole, one, number two. And, I wanna, and there's gravitons going here. Uh, and I want to calculate this higher order of perturbation theory. The way I would do it is through these generalized cuts. So this is on shell, on shell. That's a three point amplitude, three point amplitude, four point amplitude, tree amplitudes. I take those tree amplitudes. I use the double copy to turn them into Yang Mills. So now I'm doing Yang Mills calculations. Uh, oh, hmm. I'm, I'm doing Yang Mills calculations here. Uh, so we get gravity out of Yang Mills. You see it explicitly. So gravity information comes out of gauge theory very directly. OK, and this is the, the first uh, non-trivial calculation that we did. Two loops, third post minkowski in order. That's, that's what uh, our general relativity friends wanted. Uh, it, it's, of course, much more complicated than one loop. but. In any, in any case, we had the technology of doing the integrals, you know, organize it in some set of integrals that Feynman-like integrals that we, are, we understand very well how to integrate. OK, there's the answer. This is now the scattering amplitude. Uh, and you see, it, it's relatively compact. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, it looks messy, but it's actually pretty simple considering your third or order of perturbation theory. Um, and it's in terms of like standard variables that our general relativity friends use. Uh, there was one little thing, a little uh, puzzle there. There's uh, an arc cinch, and it has a mass singularity. And that mass singularity uh, actually has an amusing story that uh, I'll show you. Um, and the, the, um, there, there's also some pieces here that are they're, they're actually not physical, or they're, they're, they're not actually not interesting uh, uh, for what we want. The actual thing that we want 
um, is the corrections to the Hamiltonian, corrections to the potential. Okay, and, and you have to systematically, using the effective field theory, extract that potential. If you do it, you get something a little bit more complicated. It, it's complication has something to do with the fact that this potential is not gauge invariant. That's why it came out a little bit, a little more complicated. Um, and and here is uh, inside this coefficient. Actually, right here. See, there's coefficients, and then corrections to Newton. The, the first term is Newton, but you have to throw away p square has to go to zero. So you can't recognize it immediately in how this is written. But Newton, Newton is in the first term. Uh, in, uh, Infeld, uh, Einstein, and Hoffman, they're in the first term and the second term. Uh, some pieces of this you have to combine to get uh, their expression. Okay, and then uh, it's, it's an expression valid to all orders of perturbation theory. Now, the first question you may want to ask, okay, I'm talking about like double copy and there's unitarity and there's all this stuff, right? How do you know it's right? <laughs> That's a valid question. Uh, that, that question is, of course, of great importance to us. Also, great importance to everyone else who works in this field. Provide an answer. Is it right? Is it wrong? And you know, it's something like uh, looks like a Martian came and did it because, you know, we, we're definitely doing it in a very unusual way. Okay, um, so when we did it, one of the uh, 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 most important checks was comparing to the literature, so we can compare to the efforts of people like Ricardo and and others who did the uh, post-Newtonian calculations, fourth post-Newtonian. That's what was available at the time. Uh, and we could do comparing in the overlap. We expand the velocity, and we look at their terms, and we compare. Now, the comparison is not so simple, because Hamiltonians are not gauge invariant. So you have to find a canonical transformation. So there's some grief and effort to actually align things, because uh, it's basically like working in different gauges, and you're comparing non-gauge invariant things. But in any case, uh, we did that and it all worked. You can do a comparison in the test mass limit where uh, M1 much, much less than M2, and that's very well understood. That's basically geodesic motion in a, a Schwarzschild background, uh, and that worked. Uh, but the, the log M I um, pointed out, it, it, uh, it's related to, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, some grief that uh, Thibault d'Amour I uh, seriously questioned the, uh, the correctness of our result. He really didn't like that law again. And in fact, he wrote a paper. If you're curious, you look at version one of his paper, and he has a long list of all the things we did wrong, uh, including, I'm proud to say, uh, that we don't know how to take the classical limit. But OK. So uh, what was very enjoyable about this is we didn't have to do a damn thing. We just had to wait. So we had to wait a year. Uh, and just wait until people would do calculations. So there's Thibault. He's so eager to show us that we're wrong. He did a six, six post-Newtonian calculation, pieces of it, enough to show, you know, to, he had a prediction for what, the, what he thought the correct answer was. So he did the calculation to compare who's right and who's wrong. Well, I'm happy to say we were right. Our expression is correct. There have been many other checks. Uh, there's of calculations, other calculations of the same quantity. Actually, there's more. Uh, there were uh, two more that I forgot to list here. Uh, just done, done a few weeks ago. Um, there's a, a recent paper. Um, and um, there are also v many other checks. And uh, the good thing is, you know, despite the pounding we got, at the end, I could say that the uh, these results, they've passed highly non-trivial checks, careful scrutiny, people trying to find an error, and it survived those checks. That's how we know it's right. So the community has accepted these results as correct because of all the non-trivial checks that have been done. Okay. So that was very good. Now, if you have a good method, well, you should go test it. You know, If you say, that, hey, this is a great method, then go on. So that's what we did. Uh, so we did more calculation. Uh, the, at this order of perturbation theory, there's a new effect. It's called the tail effect. Uh, it, it basically causes serious grief with converting scattering 
to the bound state problem. There's a non-locality that is non-trivial to deal with, and that has not actually been solved yet. Okay. Um, but as long as you're thinking about large eccentricity problems, then this is fine. This this is ac actually gives the right answer. Uh, okay, th there's the answer. It's this is uh, amplitude. Uh, it's been organized into different pieces. Uh, uh, there's there's the tail effect. There's the logarithm there, and various other pieces. There's some pieces called iteration pieces. It has something to do with these iteration pieces. They're interpreted in terms of what's called. Uh, 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 well, it, it's, the it's the iteration of the lower loops. And if you understand how to organize things, they're really not a big deal. You just take it out of the calculation early. Uh, and these are the pieces that we're interested in, the high order pieces that we're interested in. There's some new things you find in elliptic integrals, not a big deal. Uh, so the definition of not a big deal is if Mathematica knows what an, the elliptic integral is, no problem. Right, it's just a function, and and if you know that if you know what it is, you're done. So, uh, that, uh, but anyway, it's a new feature that appears. You get polylogs and so forth, uh, and and that's the uh, full thing. Now, this time around, we had a much easier time verifying it because Thibault was eager for this result, so he was very kind, and he wrote a paper using our notation. You know, there's an amplitude. This is from his paper, right? Uh, so the first three terms are from his paper in our notation. So that was really great because uh, if you've ever tried converting between papers, like you have a result, someone else has a result, it's not so easy. And anyway, he did all the work on converting. So he had the first three terms. And if you, uh, this is a series expansion in velocity. It's written with something called P infinity, but it's just velocity. Uh, so we match the first three terms. Actually, one thing you can see for sure, those, those are non-trivial numbers. And the fact we match gives us great confidence that uh, we had it correct. Now, there's still some issues. Uh, life is not perfectly done. There's uh, subtlety. It, the post newtonian people, including Ricardo, they have a disagreement with this, but it has something to do with some subtlety. Uh, I think Ricardo's made great progress on this. Uh, but it's still something that has to be settled. So we're not, you know, we, we have to await the verdict uh, to be sure that everything is okay. You know, at this order of perturbation theory, there's no shortage of subtleties. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay, I'm almost done. Oops. Almost done. Oh, yeah. So how good is this stuff? Well, the first thing, there's a paper. Uh, actually, the, these plots, they're from uh, Damore and Retego. Uh, so how good is it? Well, the first thing uh, is we have numerical relativity. So this is a particular configuration that the numerical relativity people have worked out for scattering process. So we can directly compare what we have to what, what uh, numerical relativity does, or Thibault did it. Uh, he does it professional grade. Uh, so if we look at the perturbation theory itself, where you're just working order by order in the coupling, and you're solving all equations to a given order of perturbation theory. That's these colored lines. You see that you're getting closer to the dots. The dots are truth as determined by numerical relativity. You're getting closer and closer, OK? Uh, so that means that the perturbation theory is actually doing well. But near the place where you're running into strong field, so this side is strong field. This side is weak field. So weak field perturbation theory is brilliant. Strong field, it's poor. You shouldn't be surprised by that. You're using weak field perturbation. So obviously, you shouldn't do well in, well in strong field. But on the other hand, you can resum things. If you understand, let's say, about singularity structures, if you solve the equations of motion properly that determined from post-Newtonian, including also there's dissipative effects you have to include. You include everything, solve it. It's called effective one body improved. So that means you're doing it professional level. What you wind up with is perfect agreement. It's astonishing. Now, it's a bit of a fake because it happened. There's an accident here. For this 
configuration that they worked out in numerical relativity, it happens to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, but if you go to a different configuration, it's not quite as good. But uh, what it says, we are on a good track. We can do very well, even in strong field, if you include proper resummations. Okay? And in fact, this motivates us to go on because we definitely are on the right track here. And in fact, we are computing. We've written our first paper at this order. It happened to be the wrong theory. We're in electrodynamics. We did it for electrodynamics because electrodynamics is easier just to understand whether we could do it. And I'm happy to say that we can definitely do it. Um, Oh, here's something interesting. Oh, so Radu is going to be here next week. So this is a really cute plot. So um, it, you can also, oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was uh, what this is, it's the waveform off at infinity. You're looking at infinity, and a gravitational wave comes from the collision of two black holes. So two black holes scatter off each other, and they generate a gravitational wave. And this theta phi is the sphere at infinity, and you're looking at what happens. And uh, the, gra the wave is passed. Now, you may notice something a little weird. The wave is passed. Uh, yeah, but wh what happened? The metric, you know, space-time is still distorted. What happened? This is called the memory effect. If you work out the Riemann curvature, for those of you who are expert, zero on, on this configuration. But the metric has changed. So space is permanently distorted. Or maybe a much better way of saying it, if I had two satellites from LISA, or there's three of them, the wave passes. After the wave passes, they're permanently moved. That, that's basically what that, th th this plot is saying. It's very cool. And, and this is done all by amplitudes. Uh, so um, the four-point amplitudes, they're essentially potentials. They give us the, the, uh, cl the uh, conservative dynamics. You can extract that from the four-point. The five-point amplitudes, this is done from a five-point amplitude, one graviton emission, it gives you directly the waveform. It's very cool. So the quantum objects you're calculating have a direct connection to the classical things you're interested in. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Donald O'Connell will actually speak about this, probably not, not Radu. Uh, so next week, maybe there'll be a little bit more about that um, for those of you in the class. But uh, if you're not in a class anyway, it's very cool. You can do waveforms. And uh, basically, any physical observable that you can do by other techniques, you, some way of doing it by these types of techniques. OK, so what's the, I'm almost done. Yeah, I see I'm slightly over time. Uh, so uh, the outlook is good in the sense that all these different problems, state of the art, we, we've been uh, pushing that using these techniques. Uh, radiation, looking at radiation, there are many papers on that now. Uh, finite size effects, tidal effects, you can include that in this formalism. There's a set of uh, new, interac new interactions that you have to include. Uh, let's say you're interested in the deformation of a neutron star. There's a systematic way of doing that. Uh, spin effects, many people work on uh, spin effects. Uh, so that just, um, you know, the that you have a, a, a spinning object in a gravitational field. There's going to be essentially magnetic type interactions and so forth. So, so there's, there's a lot of fun you can have with that. OK, and uh, the, basic, the basic thing is uh, all the standard quantities of interest, they can be computed this way. There's been enough work in all the different areas that you can see that there's, there's a way of going forward. All right. Whoops. OK, so the summary, the last slide. Uh, oh, come on. Oh. Yeah, I've been having a little trouble with that. Uh, last slide is uh, scattering amplitudes. They give us new ways to think about problems of current interest in general relativity. Uh, this double copy idea it gives us a unified way to be thinking about uh, gauge theory and gravity all in the same breath. It's the same, except there, there's uh, two copies instead of one. Okay, there's, uh, I, I, it, uh, if we combine this with the effective field theory ideas, it gives us a powerful tool for gravitational wave physics in a form that our gravitational uh, wave theorists, that they can use it. 
uh, we've pushed state of the art. Uh, we've gone to the order G to the fourth, at least in the conservative piece. In the conservative piece, uh, the methods are nowhere close to exhausted. We can see that we can continue, at least for a while. Okay, at some point, perturbation theory will get very hard, and we won't be able to go on. But we don't see that yet. Uh, higher orders in G resummations in G spin finite size effects, radiation, uh, absorptive effects, which uh, I guess I didn't list there. Uh, it looks like all of that can, uh, or uh, that has all been, in, uh, at least uh, um, so some work has been done on every single one of those, and it's clear that you can go on. Uh, and uh, the final summary, we can expect many more advances in the coming years, not only for gravitational wave physics, but more generally for understanding gravity and its relation to the other forces uh, through the double copy. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. I had the question before other people. Uh, <laughs> the double copy, so it's more natural if you include the scalar, right, in the gravi gravity. Uh, well, include the scalar. Uh, so, I mean, if you, in, like in string theory, you get the dilaton coming in naturally together with the graviton. Uh, well, n the scalar, the scalar, we actually do things through dimensional reduction to get the, um, well, the, the dilaton, the dilaton is evil. Uh, dilatons are evil. <laughs> I'll explain privately. Okay. But, but uh, if we want a scalar, the, the much more natural way is to just use dimensional reduction to pick up the scalars. Uh, so you, you have a higher... I don't want the scalar. I just wanted what? to know if oh. you take double copy of Yang Mills, naturally you get the dilaton. Oh, yeah, so yeah, you're yeah gonna sorry. you're going to tell us why it's evil. Though. Oh, well, oh, it, <laughs> well you want to get rid of it. The way you get rid of it uh, is actually very simple. Um, and maybe if you come to the... I know, if you come to the, uh, uh, the problem session, maybe I'll... Uh, I'll okay. explain a little more about how that works. Okay. That was like the last sentence, but I didn't actually explain why it's not a big deal. I mean, the having the dilaton around, that's evil. And, uh, and it's not a good rep way to represent scalars, but uh, getting rid of the dilaton, that's not a big problem at all. I guess I was asking, suppose you left it in. Would things simplify or not? Not really. Very, mi very minor. I have a question since I have the microphone. So you mentioned the um, uh, double copy is an exact uh, property in the perturbative scheme. And uh, can you envisage an extension to it to some non-perturbative aspect of yeah. gravity? And yes, uh, I can. And luckily, I don't have to answer that because Donald O'Connell will be here, and I expect him to answer that. So for um, not for general problems, so in some ideal world if we really understood everything. You can imagine you have some solution of general relativity, some arbitrary solution, and you figure out, you know how to decompose it. That we do not know. But for some large class of theories, uh, especially those that have Kirchhild form, then it's straightforward. So there's many, many examples of that, of classical objects. For example, Schwarzschild black hole, Kerr black hole, et cetera, et cetera. There's a long list of these things where there are direct double copies of, you know, non-perturbative in the sense that it's a solution of the, let's say, Kerr black hole, and you write it in terms of solutions of gauge theory and two copies. Uh, and Donald, I uh, expect, will explain it. At least that's the title of what he's supposed to talk about. So in the double copy formalism, looks like you are completely bypassed the renormalization. Is, is that correct? No, um, no. So this double copy, it works on the integrand. So it tells us how to get gravity integrands. We still have to integrate them. And if you carefully watch what's in the double copy, there's extra powers of momenta. So in fact, unless you inspect it very carefully and do some real work, it immediately tells you it should be non-renormalizable just by power counting. Okay, so it, it's compatible with, uh, with what, you, what we already know, except if you look in more detail. Okay. In one of the slides you showed Voyager. Um, oh, sorry. In one of those gravitational wave experiments. 
Is, is that the Voyager Voyager or something? <laughs> where, where was it? Uh, uh, oh, LIGO or? Yeah, oh. the sensitivity. Oh, the sensitivity. This there thing? you go, yes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, what's the question? What's the Voyager there? Is that the Voyager? <laughs> oh, no, oh, no, oh, no, I don't think. I think, no, that's, that's not Voyager, the spacecraft. Yeah, that's yes. <laughs> the name of something else. I, I forgot what country they, they're doing that in. Uh, what's, what is it? Uh, yeah, you know. it's an upgrade. I mean, now yeah. we are in second generation detector. The LIGO, yeah. which is right now taking yeah. data, is in second generation detector. Voyager will be sort of 2.5 generation detector okay. in between LIGO and Cosmic Explorer. But where is it located? No, it's still U.S. Okay. I mean, it will but be at the same site, or it's, it's like not, it's not decided oh, okay. yet. Okay. It depends if LIGO second generation will yeah. still taking data, then they have to arrange yeah. another site. If it's dismantled, they can use the same site. Yeah, okay. And it's definitely not the spacecraft. <laughs> Thanks for the lecture. Um, you said that at some moment you throw each bar away and just pick the classical terms. So I was thinking that um, if these terms with each bar, if you can interpret them, or if someone um, is working Yeah, on it? so you can systematically, order by order in H bar, work out the correction. So you can you can have um, you you can have let's see that potential even let's say the Newtonian potential, you can work out um, an H bar you know true H bar corrections. And there are people maybe it was uh, Pierre Van Hove you can find a paper where they work it out, and it has some peculiar things. So one of the very peculiar things that happen, which in hindsight is not very peculiar, is you discover that those h-bar terms violate the equivalence principle. <laughs> now, you shouldn't get bent out of shape, because who told you that the equivalence principle is not emergent from the idea that you have spin two gravitons looking in the classical limit? Right? That's, of course, where the equ equivalence principle comes from. Uh, so those h-bar terms have some interesting things, like they violate the uh, equivalence principle. Maybe they have some issue. Maybe you could dream up of some issues that, like cosmological. But, but you know, generally, th those are those are highly suppressed. Those, like anything for like we're doing. And let's say you you would calculate the next term, and you'd ask how big is it, and should LIGO theorists be interested in it? The answer is no way. There ain't nothing there. Uh, extremely suppressed, but theoretically we can, of course, calculate that systematically as a, 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 an expansion in h-bar, order by order. It's completely straightforward. And people have done things like that. Thank you. Sorry, but isn't it, don't you get divergences on, if you could h-bar correction? Um, no, or which which divergence is? Because it's non renormalizable so don't you? And, oh, oh, well, no, we, you're doing a soft expansion. Okay. Uh, oh, also, just, just to annoy you, it turns out in classical physics you get di divergences as well. So H, you, you discover ultraviolet singularities um, due to operator mixing. And it's something I can amuse you with okay. because the, uh, the divergences are actually not related to the fact it's quantum or classical. You, you'll find very similar ultraviolet divergences just in the purely classical piece. And, and that has to do with the, the breakdown of the effective field theory description. Uh, because we're, we're uh, modeling, let's say, the neutron stars as points. And at some point, there's some complaint that happens, operator mixing with tidal and blah, blah, blah. And then uh, you encounter divergences. Mm -hmm. So it's not a big deal. Also, maybe one other comment. Divergences, in a sense, all they do, if you're working order by order and you counter one divergence, that one divergence just tells you you've lost, there's a piece you've lost. So there's one Wilson coefficient. You, you know, there's not, you know, unless you do some uh, kind of a matching or some other physics input, you don't know the value of it. So it kind of ruins things, but you can go ahead and calculate anyway uh, with just one number that's unknown. Um, maybe it's related yeah. somehow to this, I don't know. Because you comment about the five loop amplitude or something like that. that Excuse you can, me? You have a five loop? 
amplitude. I mean, you have yeah. the five loop bit uh, QCD that you know, and in principle, with the double copy, you, you also have something with five loops or something like that, right? And the question is about renormalization because when you have this five looping beta QCD, you have a renormalization scheme, and this yeah. is only for MS bar. So yeah. here you also have some renormalization scheme, or do you have to choose something? I don't know. All right. So in, in in the gravity problem, the thing we were interested in was um, the question of the very first divergence in any n equals h supergravity. So um, all those scheme questions. They're much mild. They're very mild because you're only interested in the very first diver, you know, very first divergence. Now, in okay, let's say in QCD, yes, it's true that uh, the value of the beta function depends on the scheme and blah blah. blah. But you know, uh, you know, all that you could say all the same would be true in gravity. But uh, but if you're interested in the very first divergence, let's say like one loop QCD, all of this stuff is minor. You know, minor trouble, and the uh, the the reason why none of that affected any of these multi-loop gravity calculations is you're looking for the very first divergence, so life is good. You don't have to worry about all this chaos that can come from, uh, you know, exactly what scheme you're in. Any more questions? Hi, uh, thanks for the lecture. Um, I was thinking about this memory effect because it uh, permanently changes the, 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 the I, I mean, um, the yeah, computational it, it uh, yeah, it, background. It, it, so yeah. um, maybe my question is also directed to uh, Professor Ricardo because uh, this is actually uh, losing energy the, from the gravitational wave to the to the no, background or not? Oh, oh, no, it, it's, not really. it's actually not this. You know, people make a big deal, but it's not really profound as far as I can tell. Okay. I mean, it, it, it's just that things have gotten displayed. Now, how did this happen? Uh, now, you may ask, you may think, oh, there's something very deep about space-time. Forget it. This stuff happens in electromagnetism. Same effect, you, you can find the same effects in electromagnetism. So it's not a big deal. You know, the wave passes, and after the wave passes, it just got displaced. I mean, should we be concerned? Okay, you can ref see in general relativity, you can, you can uh, make it sound much deeper. And I did that. I said, oh, and space time gets deformed. That's the memory effect. Or you could say the things just moved apart. No, but so like I was actually thinking of things getting a little bit far away. But if, uh, for instance, two satellites are a little bit more far away, uh, I mean, there's uh, energy difference from the system. No, no. they're, I mean, they're free but falling question, and. But, oh, okay. I don't know, a force, you know, force came and it shook these things. And yeah, then like, it shook yeah. them in such a way that when the shaking stopped, uh, they got displaced a little so, bit. So but, there was energy transfer, you so, know, okay. in shaking the thing, right? So, exactly. So if the, okay. So because okay. my question. My yeah. second question yeah. would be if energy is actually being lost throughout the, uh, the, 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 the direction of the wave. So uh, since the wave is coming from very far away, isn't the wave losing a lot of uh, no, energy? No, but look, it, when, okay. when a wave comes and it hits the LIGO mirror, it shakes okay. it. That took, you know, energy got yeah, okay. expended, right? Okay. This thing, you know, I don't think you should be thinking of the memory effect anything deeper than that. Okay. So they're shaking, and then when the shaking stops, they're further apart. Okay. And I think that's the correct way to look at it. Okay. Or we can say space-time got defor permanently deformed. You could also say that. Yeah, but, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? So you wrote down this CK what? duality what identity for C A C T and C U, right? Yeah. For N, N, N S. For Jacobi, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I was wondering if this identity breaks down at some loop order or something like that. Uh, I'm sorry. I. I was wondering if this identity breaks down at some loop order. Well, <coughs> um, yeah. Uh, it actually there's grief happens uh, at high loop orders depending on what you do. So. Um, if you're applying the identities and all the double, double copy, 
uh, on the pieces that you sew, so there's tree amplitudes and you sew them, then no problems because it's all at tree level. Now, you could get more ambitious and try to use this color kinematics duality directly, not you know, after the sewing, you sew everything together and you want it still to be satisfied globally. It turns out that you can do this all the way to four loops in uh, N equals four super Yang mills where we inspected it, but you, know, you can go to a certain loop order and then one more loop order, something goes bad. And what exactly goes bad, I can't tell you. I just know that we have not been able to find s such a representation. On the other hand, that problem doesn't stop you from calculating because you can do calculations in a different way. I mean, you have to reorganize how you do it. So the, the color kinematics duality, it runs into trouble, which we don't understand. At high enough loop orders, if you try to organize in terms of diagrams, which are off shell completely. But if you're doing these cuts, it's OK. Any more questions? Okay. okay, so let's thank Steve again for this talk. Okay.